Hey there, history buffs. Welcome to the History from the Homestead podcast. I'm your host, Thomas Carroll, and today we're joined by not one but two guests from the Great Lake Shipwreck Museum. So we'll start off, uh, I guess, with Bruce. Tell us a little bit about what you do there and who you are. Well, thank you, Thomas, and thanks for ha having us. Um, my name is Bruce Lynn. I'm the director of the Great Lake Shipwreck Museum. Uh, that's a small museum. It's located up at Whitefish Point in Michigan's eastern upper peninsula. Uh, we uh, like to talk about shipwrecks up there, obviously. Uh, the, the Edmund Fitzgerald is about 17 miles northwest of where Whitefish Point is located. Uh, we have a, the oldest operating lighthouse on Lake Superior up there, and we have a number of uh, United States Coast Guard buildings up there as well, and uh, U.S. Navy buildings from the 1920s. So uh, a big part of my job up there is keeping uh, everything operating and, and keeping the, uh, you know, keeping the place staffed and you know, keeping the, uh, uh, helping our staff, I guess, to keep the history alive up there as well. Uh, we have a small museum also located in Sault Ste. Marie. It's in an 1890s era Weather Bureau building. And that's actually where I'm sitting today. It's a sunny day. There's green grass, uh, which is kind of crazy right now because just not long ago, we had about a foot of snow on the ground. So uh, we're happy about that. But again, thank you, Thomas. I appreciate your having us. Sure. And Corey, go ahead and tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, I am the content slash communications director for the Shipwreck Society, and uh, I, I uh, have been with the Shipwreck Society since 2006 um, as a board member. Um, I was hired on as for this position last year, and I love it. And my job is to basically, uh, you know, communicate and content create. So. I've been doing a lot of documentaries. We got a lot of things in the pipeline as far as getting the stories out of these shipwrecks and and uh, you know and a lot of other things that we're working on. So it's a uh, it's a it's a great job um, working with great people. And uh, Whitefish Point is definitely a very very magical place for not only us but for a lot of people that visit. Yeah, and and that's great. So I I appreciate you guys joining me. So. You mentioned it there, Bruce, the Edmund Fitzgerald, which I promise everybody we're going to get into that. But I think we should head more towards some of the other shipwrecks because the the Great Lakes themselves are quite notorious for shipwrecks, many of which have not even been found yet. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's there's about 6,000 shipwrecks on the Great Lakes in total. Uh, depends on what statistic you're looking at. Uh, and in the area of Whitefish Point alone, um, there's roughly 200 shipwrecks that have been recorded in that area. So there's, uh, Thomas, there's a lot of reasons for these shipwrecks. The weather obviously is a huge part of it. Um, you know, if you think of technology of the ships, maybe going back to the 1880s, 1900s, early 1900s, uh, they didn't have the technology that, that those ships have that are out there today. Uh, they're traveling the lakes. They tended to be smaller. Um, they would often uh, be leaving port at times when, when they probably shouldn't have. And much of that has to do with weather reporting, which is so much better today. But if you look at Whitefish Point, just as an example, and if your listeners find it on a map, um, you know, you'll see that it's a funnel. You have all of your ship traffic coming in and out of Lake Superior have to go right past Whitefish Point. So that if you could just let alone reduced visibility, snowstorms, fog, even uh, forest fires in the late 1800s would obscure visibility. Collision was a big concern. So some of the shipwrecks we talk about at the museum are a result of collision, uh, but also the weather driving these ships ashore, uh, coupled with the fact that there were no natural harbors for about a stretch of roughly 80 miles, going from Whitefish Point to the area of what's called the Picture Rocks National Lakeshore today. You combine all those factors and we end up with uh, a few hundred shipwrecks right along that stretch, 200, like I said, approximately. Uh, but that number, again, you look at statistics, it could either be higher, could be lower, uh, depending on what articles you're reading and, and what research has been done. Uh, but there's no shortage of uh, shipwrecks on the bottom of Lake Superior right in that area. And most yeah, of them. Uh, oh, go ahead, Corey. I was just saying, uh, there, uh, there are hundreds of shipwrecks out there. and. 
the interesting thing that people start to realize when they come visit the museum and uh, and and see some of the stories we tell is uh, every wreck is kind of different as far as the story goes. Um, people, uh, you know, there's a lot of life and loss out there, and uh, the wrecks that we do uh, tell the story of, um, you can. There's differences in every single one of them, and people walk around our our museum just amazed at some of the other stories that uh, they learn when they come to our museum. Yeah, I I think about some of the shipwrecks. The one that got me years ago, as I said before when we were talking, I used to go up to Lake Erie fishing a lot. And there was a little bar in Erie, I don't remember the name of it, that had a big giant map of Lake Erie. And it just, with the known shipwrecks, just pinpointed all over the place. And it was astounding. You know, even, you know, shipwrecks back to the, back to the 1800s with the wooden, you know, the little wooden sloops or whatever you'd like to call them. It was just amazing. Uh, and, and also that impressed me with the weather up there, how the, the waves can change. I mean, we've been out on Erie where it was a perfectly calm day and within 20 minutes you're into five foot swells or more. They just come out of nowhere. Yeah, that happened a lot um, up at Whitefish Point and along what it is called the Shipwreck Coast. Uh, if you go up there right now, there's barely anything between Whitefish Point and Grand Marais. Um, there's just, there's maybe a cottage here and there. So, you know, think of the technology we have today. And when a shipwreck, when a ship would be in trouble out there, um, there wasn't a lot anybody could do. Um, there were life-saving stations built along that shore, but Oftentimes, there was, uh, sometimes the ships were just out of luck. I mean, like the um, the Jupiter and Saturn that, that sank, they're, they're both shallow wrecks just uh, west of Whitefish Point. Um, a lot of those sailors washed ashore and were never identified. There's a little cemetery west of us, too, that has a bunch of unknown graves. It just says unknown, there's a cross. And some of those people from those wrecks are there so it's it's a it's a very uh it's a temperamental lake um you know and uh it's just it's just back then there was nothing that these people could do if they if they did make it ashore uh more than often the weather would take them out so um they, yeah a lot of times there would be there wouldn't be any place they could get in to get out of you know out of the elements or you know shelter so Corey bringing up a good point, the life-saving stations, there were four of them that were built along that stretch that he just referenced called the Shipwreck Coast. That's that 80-mile stretch I was referencing before. And uh, that's a whole nother, Thomas, that's a whole nother chapter of history that I think most people don't know about. Uh, you know, we think of the Coast Guard with the life-saving service was a predecessor. And think of the lighthouse also, the lighthouse service being in there too. But the lighthouse, the life-saving service rather is kind of interesting because their whole mission in life was if a ship were getting in trouble and if they knew about it, because again, they didn't have radio communications per se back then. They didn't, their way of knowing a ship was in trouble would be if they saw a flare, if they saw a ship with the, you know, the inverted American flag, uh, you know, indicating that ship was in trouble. So very, um, very basic their way of identifying a ship in distress but if it was their whole goal was to get out there and try to do something about it and if you think about a you know a couple hundred foot long schooner or a steel steamship that's in trouble out on the lake uh if, if that big of a ship is in trouble well guess what you've got to take your open boat now and you're pulling on oars to get out there it just it tells you how dramatic their their work really was and uh, a lot of life-saving service crews you know, they didn't always make it, I guess. Um, they didn't always get back. And there's a famous quote uh, that goes, you had to go out, but nothing said you had to come back. Uh, and it, it really speaks to the kind of work that they did. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, I didn't even know about that. Um, I always thought about the Coast Guard. I, I never really thought about the, the stations beforehand. Um, so when when did the Coast Guard really start setting up their do we know for sure? Because, I mean, we've been sailing on the Great Lakes since recorded time, basically. 
it, Thomas, it depends on how you're asking the question, but the, the Coast Guard itself came into being in 1915. Uh, so you had the uh, Lifesaving Service and the Revenue Cutter Service combined at that point and formed the Coast Guard. If we go a little further ahead in time, 1939, the Coast Guard, uh, the Lighthouse Service became a part of the Coast Guard at that point. So, so you had all these different entities that were predecessors to the modern Coast Guard, but much of what the modern Coast Guard does now was encompassed in these different government entities back in the day. Does that help? I wasn't sure exactly how you wrap. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It almost like they all incorporated to one, one service, if you will. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Now, it might be a tough one to answer, but how far back do we know? As far as let's call it commercial shipping, because we know the Native Americans used the lakes with their canoes and their dugouts. But how far back do we know for commercial shipping, actually shipping of goods from port to port? Well, the, the Griffin, which nobody has found yet, um, that happened in the 1600s. Was it 1649, Bruce? Wow. Yeah, that sounds right. And I almost started chuckling a little bit, Corey, when you said that no one has found it yet. And <laughs> Thomas, that <laughs> it's funny, the... Uh, and, and again, some of your listeners may know part of the story of the Griffin. I think it's been found about 75 times, but nobody's <laughs> ever found it. Um, everybody thinks they're finding it. And there have been quotes that it's the quote unquote holy grail of shipwrecks on the Great Lakes. But but Corey answered that exactly right. The Griffin, and let's just say, you know, middle 1600s, but I think you're right uh, on the date, Corey, 1649. But it was really arguably the first commercial ship and shipwreck because it it sank on its maiden voyage it disappeared but it was the fur trade back then that was the commerce uh you had to think in terms of the the lakes being a great highway system which really they are today the difference being today you know we have railroads we have freeways we have other arteries for you know commercial traffic to be moving but back then it was all wilderness New France at that point, and the commerce was, you know, bales of furs uh, and trade goods with the Native Americans and the tribes and that kind of thing. So, so commercial shipping and shipwrecks, uh, and the first commercial vessel is the first shipwreck on the Great Lakes. Wow, and um, you 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 kind of stunned me with the 1600s. I I, I did I never really thought about the Griffin. I I was thinking like the 1800s and stuff when we started you know, coal-powered steamships and and so on and so forth. But I, I never thought about that. That's interesting. So Yeah, the uh, uh, shipping in Lake Superior didn't become, um, uh, it became a much more popular in the 1850s when the first lock was built in Sault Ste. Marie. So what they used to have to do before the locks was actually take the vessel out of the water and portage it to um, the Lake Superior level because there's a 20, 21 or 23 foot difference between Lake Superior and Lake here on the, and the Lake here on level. So there's still a, a street in Sault Ste. Marie called Portage Street where that where they used to do that. Um, so uh, the you know commercial shipping really really picked up in the in the 1850s. And now it just got bigger and bigger. Now you you mentioned that did they do that by rail? Because if you know any of my listeners remember my first episode, we talked about the Allegheny Portage Railroad here, which was the canal boats over the mountain. So did they do that also by rail? Just put the ship like on rail cars and and kind of essentially winch them up over? They they actually so they did a little bit of both. They did. Uh, there was a time there where they would actually unload one ship, and they have like a little rail mini rail system that they would move the cargo from the lake huron side uh to the lake superior level as corey was saying but they would also portage entire ships uh so the uh, there's a vessel and there's actually in inside the main gallery of the shipwreck museum uh, up there at whitefish point there is part of the keel of a ship believe it or not so when you go through the gallery um you're actually seeing part of a vessel called the independence that's up there but that ship was actually portaged 
uh, on what's called, as, and again, Corey just referenced at Portage Avenue, it's here in Sault Ste. Marie. So they actually took an entire vessel from one lake level to the other. That obviously took weeks. It wasn't, uh, it certainly was not the easiest project uh, to move a ship, you know, from one lake to the other. Um, but again, as Corey was saying, 1855, the Sioux locks opened up. Uh, they're quite a bit bigger today. I'm actually looking at them right now in my office, uh, believe it or not. A ship went through a little while ago. Um, but yeah, yeah, mid-1850s, you really had, there was ship traffic on Lake Superior, just to use that lake as an example, before 1855. But after the locks opened up, then you really had a dramatic increase in ship traffic up here. And they were carrying, you know, they were carrying uh, people that were settling on these kind of far-flung communities in Lake Superior. You had uh, merchandise, and different things like that, that these communities would need to survive. But you also had raw materials, copper, iron ore, coal, things like that, that were being transported on these ships. And uh, the independence is interesting because it's, you know, again, it was it was the first steamship on Lake Superior, but it was also one of the very first uh, shipwrecks uh, of a steamship on the lake as well. And this one was no collision or anything like that. It was a boiler explosion uh, that sank that particular ship. It was barely out of the St. Mary's River going up into Whitefish Bay. But it speaks to the danger at that time of traveling, you know, on these vessels. There were so many different ways these ships could get into trouble. Uh, and, you know, who knew that they would have a boiler explosion, but that's exactly what happened. So, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of wrecks happen in, in Whitefish Bay. You know, everybody, uh, when there's a storm um, popping up, a lot of people want to uh, run to Whitefish Bay to, to take cover. Um, but Whitefish Bay was also very dangerous as well during um, fog. If, uh, you know, if a blanket of fog would come in, there was a lot, a lot of shipwrecks by collision out there. This is the Superior City being one of them, um, 28 men died on that. Um, when it when it got ran into and the cold waters of Whitefish Bay um, hit the boiler and it blew up. So there's there's uh, there's a lot of different stories out there. Yeah, and I I was going to ask you about the locks, but you kind of hit on that, Bruce. But I thought that would be even sort of a nice segue into the more modern shipping because we were gonna, as I said, we were going to talk about the Fitzgerald, which we just. Uh, unfortunately lost Gordon Lightfoot who famously wrote the song about it that's you know the Fitzgerald's got to be the most famous shipwreck on the lakes of all of them it, it definitely is you know we've had a speaker a gentleman by the name of Fred Stonehouse he's a uh, researcher he's an author dozens of uh, <clears throat> excuse me books on Great Lakes shipwrecks <clears throat> excuse me um he came at one of our November the 10th and the Fitzgerald Memorial Ceremonies we do each year. And Fred had, a, a, I think, a very accurate statement in that the Edmund Fitzgerald has come to represent shipwrecks on the Great Lakes, period. It is the one that most people, if they're aware of a shipwreck on the Great Lakes, they know about the Fitzgerald. But as Corey was alluding to, too, you know, there are different stories for all these wrecks. But in a lot of ways, they all share certain common factors, you know, each each ship that sank had a crew, you know, each one of those crew members had a family at home. Uh, you know, they were out there doing their jobs. And maybe they ended up being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, but, but certainly there are, there are wrecks that, you know, <laughs> the Eastland is a good example. And I'm, I'm not Thomas trying to get us away from the Fitzgerald. Uh, we'll get back to that, I know. Uh, but the, there's a vessel called the Eastland that sank at a dock in uh, Chicago. It was a passenger vessel. Uh, it ended up getting loaded improperly and it, it just healed over and sank right at the dock. And I want to say, and I'm forgetting the exact number, there, there were hundreds of people, I'll just put it that way, hundreds of people that drowned when that ship healed over and they were trapped below decks. Um, that's a very, that's kind of an unusual story. But if you look at the vast majority of those 6,000 shipwrecks on the lakes, they really do, they do have certain things in, in common. And the Fitzgerald, in some ways, has become that shipwreck that we can talk about at the museum that gives us the ability to start talking about all these other shipwrecks that are out there. Because for the most part, they're, they're unknown. Yeah, and that's, and that's a really good point, because 
you know, every year when they told the bell for the Fitzgerald, there was, they told it 29 times for the men lost. And then once more for all the others that were lost before them and even after them. So that's maybe good and bad in a way. It's good. Good that everybody gets the recognition, but it, it's tough being that everybody knows the one when there's been so many, so many before. Well, that's, and, that's part of that's part of our mission too is to get those stories out there and, and educate people on those wrecks yeah and you know you you mentioned something there bruce Let's, i kind of think about dive into that you mentioned the passenger ship was was there much viable passenger shipping on the lakes i i'd never really you always think of the ore freighters and but you don't think about you know any passenger shipping was there much of that Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's kind of making a comeback now, too. I think people often when they see a Viking ship, um, you know, Viking, what used to, well, is Viking River Cruises, but they also have passenger vessels that are all over the world, really. But they are coming into the Great Lakes. And in more recent years, there's been uh, kind of an uptick in passenger ships on the lakes. But if you go back, uh, passenger vessels just for pleasure on the Great Lakes was not uncommon at all. You look at places like Mackinac Island, they had uh, different shipping lines, uh, the Georgian Bay Line, the Detroit and Cleveland Steamship Company. Uh, there's any number of different companies that were out there that would be taking people from the cities, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, um, you know, Buffalo, uh, so on and so forth, and taking people up into the upper lakes where in the summer, it would be much cooler. Uh, and then the railroad lines also own steamships and passenger vessels too. So it was it was very popular in the lakes. It wasn't, today it's almost like a luxury type of uh, form of travel. But back then, you know, you would have high school senior classes that would be going on a vessel called the North American or the South American and going up into, uh, you know, Northern Lake Huron or Northern Lake Michigan and visiting Mackinac Island or going all the way across Lake Superior and going to Duluth. In places like that so it was pretty common and for any of your listeners that might go to Mackinac Island you'll see different references depending on you know what attraction or let's say you go up to Fort Mackinac you'll see references and you'll see photographs of these massive ships uh, most often wooden vessels steamships that were traveling on the lakes and beautiful beautiful ships um, very common yeah yeah that's to say see there's you, you anybody that really thinks about it especially the modern lakes you you know you don't think about passenger vessels you think about the fishing boats and the the boat owners and the the giant ore freighters i i've never really didn't even consider passenger vessels in this but yeah i could i could see it yeah i kind of wish it was like that today i <laughs> i would love to take a cruise um you know, and see some of these parts of the lakes that we're, we're fortunate at the museum. We have a research vessel and we're all over Lake Superior and, and different parts of uh, very far northern Lake Huron. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you get out there and you see a lot of islands, you see things that you would never and most people would never see. But when those passenger vessels were out there cruising, um, you know, it had to be wonderful to take those things. Again, it's very, very expensive these days to go on a uh, on a cruise on the Great Lakes. Yeah, that would be fun to do. I, you know, I'd never been out on Superior or just Erie, but that that would be fun because they're those lakes are not small. If anybody's never been to them, they are not small lakes. Um, if you ever wanted to do a, a, a nice two and a half hour cruise there's a uh, passenger vessel called the emerald isle that goes back and forth from charlotte to beaver island and i've been on that in 10 foot waves and uh it was not a fun experience <laughs> but uh that's a that's a nice that's a nice uh, quick trip if you ever wanted to do anything like that so anyway we were we were talking about the fitzgerald and that's I guess we'll, we'll head our way back to that. It was November 10th when we lost it, 1975, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. That's exactly right. I'd say I was reading up on it again last night, trying to refresh my memories. Um, but I, I guess what, as far as shipwrecks, that's we don't know what even happened to the Fitzgerald yet, for sure. 
That's correct. There, there's a lot of theories. There's a, <laughs> there's new theories. It seems like all the time that are coming up about why it sank. Uh, there's a, there's an interesting part of the story. The Edmund Fitzgerald is that the story just continues to grow in a lot of ways. And Gordon Lightfoot is a part of that story. His writing the song, the popularity of the song, and and getting that that ship into the public imagination. That's really part of the story too. But if you look at the basics of the story itself, you know, it was it was not an unusual situation. It was November the 9th, uh, you know, November on the Great Lakes period is not a, a great time of year to be sailing out there on the lakes. But but these ships, you know, that was a 729 foot four carrier, massive ship. It wasn't that old at that point, but, uh, you know, it was built in 1958 at the Great Lakes Engineering Works down there in Detroit, River Rouge, that area. Uh, but November 9th, uh, 1975, it left Superior, Wisconsin, loaded up with iron ore. Uh, they knew, and I say they, the, the captain and clearly the crew, but Captain Ernst McSorley, he was aware that there was a weather front that was coming in uh, and that Lake Superior was probably not going to be super smooth as they were crossing, but but it wasn't unusual. They expected that at that time of the year. Uh, the Fitzgerald itself was actually a weather reporting ship. So they would take different observations and readings and they would report that back uh, to, uh, you know, the weather service and their shipping company, the Columbia Transportation Division, uh, the Ogle Bay Norton Company. But the bottom line was they left November the 9th. Um, they were coming up the north shore of Lake Superior. There was another ship called the Arthur M. Anderson came out of two harbors. It was loaded up with iron ore as well. Uh, Captain uh, Bernie Cooper uh, on board that ship uh, was in contact with Ernest McSorley on board the Fitzgerald. And they they determined because of this weather that they knew they were going to get into to take a more northerly course to hopefully use that Canadian shoreline as a little bit of a buffer. They could get into the, the lee of that shoreline and hopefully not get beat up by the wind so badly and the waves. So they took that northerly course and uh, had a relatively uneventful crossing of Lake Superior, you know, high winds, pretty good sized waves, but nothing that they weren't, you know, capable of dealing with. Um, at least so they thought, and got to that northeast corner of Lake Superior. There's an area called the Slate Islands, and they made their turn. Uh, we're Canadian waters at this point. Made their turn to head down towards Whitefish Bay, and uh, they, they ended up passing an island called Mitch Bacotten and another island called Caribou. These are some of these interesting islands that are out there in the lake that, again, most people will never see. Uh, but they kind of threaded the needle between those islands. And somewhere along the lines, um, the Fitzgerald took some damage. Uh, uh, Captain McSorley had reported back to uh, Captain Cooper on the Anderson that they had been taking on water. They had, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a, an issue going on with fence rails and vents. Their radar was out. They had a list going on. That's kind of unusual for a captain on board of a, a ship to be reporting that over the radio. That's not something necessarily you're gonna tell the world about, but he, he obviously had some concern as to what was happening with the Fitzgerald at that point. And as they were closing in on Whitefish Bay, uh, the Whitefish Point lighthouse at that point had been knocked out by a power outage and the generators, you know, this was operated by the Coast Guard. Uh, we're still an operating lighthouse now, but at that point, they had generators, but a switch stuck, so the lighthouse wasn't operating. I don't think it really would have made a big difference for the Fitzgerald anyways at that point. But somewhere about uh, 17 miles northwest of Whitefish Point, the Fitzgerald just simply disappeared. And if you look at the statements of uh, Captain Cooper and his first mate in the pile house of the Arthur M. Anderson, and you have to keep in mind, they had just kind of fought their way across the lake getting buffeted around uh, a very rocky ride, I'm sure, especially as they were getting closer to Whitefish Bay. Um, I think the crew, at least on the Anderson at that point, were breathing a sigh of relief. They were just about to get into the bay where it was going to be calmer. They wouldn't have to worry, you know, at that point about what was happening out on the big lake. But they had had communications with the Fitzgerald. Uh, the last words from the Fitzgerald were, and from Captain McSorley, is we're holding our own. Because, you know, they'd been asking questions about their condition, they being the crew on the Anderson. 
So at some point, a snowstorm came through. They lost visibility. They couldn't see the Fitzgerald for a few moments. And then that snow squall cleared up about as quickly as it came. And at that point, they couldn't see the lights of the Fitzgerald anymore because they had had visual contact. They also couldn't see it on their radar screen either. And at that point, I don't think anybody really thought, I don't think anybody on the Anderson thought that the Fitzgerald had, you know, they didn't think it sank at that point. I mean, how could that ship sink that quickly? And they were looking for lights. They were seeing lights. Those ended up seeing, they, they were lights on the Canadian side of the lake there, the Canadian shoreline. And then after a while, they really started getting worried. And that's when they started reporting to the Coast Guard that there might be a problem here. And I think the Coast Guard didn't believe it either. Who could imagine that that relatively new ship could sink that quickly? And there was a missing open 16-foot boat. The Coast Guard came back and said, keep an eye out for that. And again, they're communicating with uh, Captain Cooper on board the Anderson. And uh, the longer they looked and the longer they were not seeing that that little blip on the radar screen there of the Anderson, then they really were getting worried. And and, then obviously we know it sank. But as you said, Thomas, we don't know exactly why it sank. There were no survivors. Uh, Every one of the different expeditions that have gone down to take a look at the Fitzgerald and see the wreck site, and it's in over 500 feet of water, there have been more questions that have been raised than answers as to why it sank. So it is a mystery. And I think that's part of why people are so interested in it, among many other things. Gordon Lightfoot, of course, being a big part of that, too. And I just say the mystery certainly drives drives the lore of it as well. Um, and I, I think it's fair to note that Captain McSorley was not, he was a fairly well-known captain. He was, he was fairly known as a bad weather, a bad weather captain. So he knew what he was doing. But. yeah he was a heavy weather sailor they called him and he would go right through storms and uh you know he'd done it his entire career uh, and, and it hadn't and he started really from the ground up i think he started as a deckhand on a on a steamship and worked his way up and so he knew the lakes and uh he was very experienced uh, so yeah that adds a little bit to the story certainly as well yeah and you mentioned the uh the arthur m anderson too which if anybody gets up to the lakes, it's still uh, it's still currently in service, I, I believe. I know I heard they were going to do an overhaul on it, but I don't know if they had done that. But It's, it's on Lake Superior right now. There you go. Yeah, we see it come through the locks here <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, and that, I, I, I mentioned that because, like the Fitzgerald, oh. these big ore freighters were built to last. They were built to last a long time like the i'm not sure when the when the anderson was built but i mean it conceivably like the fitzgerald could even had it not sank would possibly still be in service to this day these were built to last a long time they were and it's it's also and yeah there's a very good chance that the uh, fitzgerald would still be sailing today but if you think about it too it's fresh water so it's not salt water you see a lot of these ocean going ships coming through and you'll see how rusted a lot of them are and that salt water can be uh much harder you know on those steel ships Uh, so there have been some ships that sailed on the great lakes and there was one up until about oh gosh Corey, you know what i'm talking about um there's a vessel and its name is not coming to me but it was over 100 years old uh, that was still operating on the lakes uh and so built to last certainly big stout vessels um but that fresh water makes a difference too there you go <laughs> Corey's got his book that ship's had how many different names now too yeah yeah it was uh yeah this was over 100 years old and it was the saint mary challenger and i think and, it was the medusa challenger at one time too I think. yeah but it's now being used as a floating barge I believe, or did they scrap that? I, I'm not. I, I think they scrapped it. I could be wrong on that, but some of the and Thomas and for your listeners, a lot of times they'll take the hulls of these vessels and uh, they'll either use them for breakwaters. Sometimes, you know, they'll sink them in place. And uh, there's a couple. There's a steel plant here, just uh, here in Sault Ste. Marie, and they've got a, at least one, maybe two ships that have been sunk in place, and they're used as breakwaters. But also sometimes they'll just remove the 
the deck cabins and, and remove parts of the decks and use them as barges and things like that too. So some of these old halls are still operating here. Uh, that's interesting. Um, that's I just I was just trying trying to remember how old the Anderson was. Uh, but anyway, think, we'll move on. I think on. it was built in fifty eight. So pretty much right around the same time as the Fitzgerald. Yeah. I, I think so, yeah. There were some that were built in the 40s that are still operating uh, here even now. Um, but yeah, I think Corey's right. I'd have to look to be sure just to to verify what year the Anderson was built. Yeah, and we and so we don't have to do that now. I can I can definitely correct it. Okay, well. Did, did you Google it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I caught I caught a mistake on our part, Thomas. We lied to you and your audience a second ago. Oh, it no. wasn't 1649 on the Griffin. It was 1679. I had a book on my shelf. <sighs> we were close. We were close. Uh, but the fact that it was the 1600s, again, that's, that's pretty amazing. I'll call that close enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> so... I, I think we should definitely talk briefly about the night that Fitzgerald went down because the weather that night was definitely above average, if you will. I, I don't know if that's a good way to describe it. We're, we're talking up to reported waves of 30-some feet high, which is extensive for the lakes even. that's If you think about 30 feet, that's nearly as tall as your house. Yeah, 30, 35, I've seen 30, 35 foot waves reported. Uh, they clocked here in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, where the locks are, they clocked 90 mile per hour winds here at that time. Um, the Mackinac Bridge, which is about an hour south of us here, that massive span, uh, there was actually a semi, the, the wind blew the semi over on top of a car. Um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with the Mackinac Bridge, Thomas, you probably are, and your listeners probably are too. It kind of looks like the Golden Gate, only it's longer, big suspension bridge. Um, but yes, it was a, a dramatic, dramatic storm, no question, kind of unusual. But I'll say this too, there were a lot of other ships out on the lake that night. There were ships that were in Whitefish Bay waiting the storm out, but there were also other ships out on the big lake uh, as well. So something, and that's kind of the mystery, something must have happened to the Fitzgerald at some point um, as it was closing in, and this is closing in on Whitefish Bay, but this is where all the theories come in. Yeah, Captain and Cooper of the uh, Anderson said he had waves break over the top of the pilot house of the Anderson, so just uh, think of how big that is. Yeah, it's like a little apartment building almost on top, <laughs> on top of the ship. Um, but yeah, there, there have been some theories here recently too, and some of them are interesting. Some Some aren't, some are though. Uh, so there's there's been a recent theory that has been brought up, which speaks to a piece of equipment that was on the deck of the Fitzgerald called a hatch crane. The hatch crane is used to pull off off these massive, heavy, heavy steel hatch covers that are clamped down uh, on over the you know the openings or the the hatches themselves that would allow all the cargo to be loaded and then taken back out again, unloaded on the ship. And there's a theory. Uh, that has been brought up that perhaps that hatch crane, as the ship was being rolled around so much in the storm, maybe that hatch crane broke loose partially and maybe accidentally wedged one of those hatch covers open, which allowed that much more water to come in. Because there's, if you listen and you read the transcripts, but if you listen to the radio traffic between the Anderson and the Fitzgerald, there's at one point, you could hear Captain McSorley in the back uh, basically yelling, don't let no one out on deck. You know, and that seems logical, right? It's a terrible storm. You don't want anybody going out there. They might get swept off the deck of the vessel. But it's also, it begs the question, why would he have to tell anybody that if the conditions were that bad? And I think with this particular theory is that they might have been wrestling with a problem on that deck and they had to try to take care of it. But at the same time, by putting someone out there to try to, let's say, for example, if the hatch crane had broken loose, it had caused damage to one of the hatches. But if you had waves like Corey was just referencing, they were clearing over the top of the pilot house or maybe six, eight feet tall over the deck. 
you can't let someone out there. There's no way that they could affect a repair. They'd be swept overboard probably unless they were able to, you know, connect themselves somehow to the vessel. Um, but even then, not able to really work effectively if you're spending half your time hanging on for dear life as the uh, waves are trying to wash you overboard anyway. Um, and, and to think about that, because for anybody that doesn't really know the about the ore freighters and that, to get from one end of the ship to the other, they did not have to go on deck. You know, they could take the tunnels from front to back, so there, it wouldn't be... He wasn't just trying to stop them from going from bow to stern or stern to bow, as they did not need to do that. So it, it makes sense that maybe something happened that would rise to need to put men on deck. Exactly. So, and, and the, the loss of the Fitzgerald definitely changed a lot of the shipping regulations as far as, as weights and freeboard and everything. Which kind of, I want to bring me to the next question. Have we lost any of the big freighters since then? No. Not no, so much in the Great Lakes. Sorry, Bruce. Oh, go ahead, Corey. Oh, but we have lost some on, on, on the ocean. Um, the, uh, what was the most recent one that was, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but there was have been. The Alfaro or something? Yeah, I was thinking of something else. Um, yeah. There have been there have been other accidents on the Great Lakes. Uh, you've had ships that have run aground. Um, there there was a Coast Guard uh, buoy tender called the Mesquite that ran aground off the Keweenaw Peninsula, Western Lake Superior, very rugged shoreline. The Mesquite ran aground. Um, it was late, late, late in the season, and the conditions really made it difficult to recover that vessel. And then over the winter. You know, between the ice and just how rough the conditions were, it ended up sinking. Um, but different, not a, you know, not a commercial freighter or anything like that, but still a vessel operating, much less a Coast Guard vessel, you know, operating on the lakes. But certainly there have been a lot of accidents, just not a catastrophic loss of life like the Fitzgerald. But the other thing, if you look at the Fitzgerald, there were other shipwrecks leading up to the Fitzgerald. One was 1966. Ship called the Daniel J. Morrell uh, up on northern Lake Huron and broke apart and sank. Um, you know, about 29 man crew. There was one survivor on board, a man by the name of Dennis Hale. Um, most people are not aware, unless you're a, a shipping, Great Lakes ship, you know, what we would call a boat nerd maybe, or a shipwreck enthusiast. Those people will be aware of the Morrell, but most people have never heard of it. But the story is fascinating and Dennis Hale he unfortunately passed away a few years ago but Dennis would travel all over the Great Lakes and he would come to museums like ours he'd go to libraries he would be invited to conferences and he would tell his story uh, about his ship his crewmates what happened that night I mean he was out there for 38 hours on a life raft and uh, he had several of his crewmates with him uh, and he ended up being the only one that survived so you know, in some ways, shipwrecks like that, I find every bit as interesting, if not even a little bit more, because we can see through his memories of that night and those 38 hours of what happened to his ship. Um, so so certainly, Thomas, to answer your question, no catastrophic loss of life shipwrecks on the Great Lakes since the Fitzgerald, but there certainly were a number even in recent years leading up to it. And as Corey pointed out, you know, on the ocean, that's a whole nother story right there. Now, I, I I know some of the the ocean going ships come come through into the Great Lakes. Do any of the lakes uh, lakes freighters ever go out to the ocean, or do they they stick to the lakes themselves? They pretty much stick to the lakes. The, it depends on the vessel, but some of these ships, like the one thousand footers, can't really get through the St. Lawrence Seaway and the the Welland Canal, and so they'll they're those 1,000 footers are strictly Great Lakes use, uh, but there are some of the older ships and the smaller ones, um, you know, occasionally they might make their way. And if you look at the history of shipping on the lakes, even some of the whaleback vessels, and that's a whole nother story too, a very unique kind of ship that operated on the Great Lakes. There were some of those that operated on the oceans as well. But what ends up happening in a lot of cases, a lot of the Great Lakes freighters, when they're being scrapped, end up being purchased by firms that are overseas. And so they'll be towed 
you know, across the Atlantic or what have you. And they'll often break up and they become shipwrecks, you know, out in the middle of the ocean uh, because, you know, these are old ships. Maybe they haven't been maintained for a little while because they're being scrapped and uh, they're being towed. And, and you can see we've got some pretty interesting imagery of ships that are breaking up out of the high seas, but they were Great Lakes freighters forever. They just didn't make it across the ocean to be scrapped. That's almost just a horrible investment. If you're the scrapper, you spend all that for it and then lose it anyway. But um, that's where insurance comes in. I think. Yeah, well, that's true. Which you know, and that's interesting. You mentioned that because I, I was going to mention that earlier. Like the Fitzgerald was owned by an insurance company. That's that's kind of it's funny you kind of mentioned that because they were owned by what was it Northwest Mutual, uh, and it was named after their president. Yeah, yes. that's exactly right. And well, I guess here we we've, we've taken up about an hour of your time. Before we before we close out, why don't you tell us a little bit about the museum itself? Um, it is about it's a little over an hour north of the Mackinac Bridge. Um, it's it's an it's an adventure to even go there um, because you you drive through a lot of wilderness and, and small towns and um, you, you go through a little town called Paradise and you have 10 more miles to go and it's right along uh, Whitefish Bay and you, you all of a sudden you turn around this corner and there's this beautiful lighthouse welcoming you. Um, and so when you when you get to our campus, you 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 know, you can buy a ticket to go through the museum and uh, there's uh, other buildings that uh, you can go and learn about the life-saving service, um, what life was like it, uh, living in a lighthouse. And uh, it's it's just a really relaxing, peaceful place to go learn about Great Lakes history. And, you know, we do get quite a few visitors um, and 99.9% .9 of them walk away inspired and, and, and happy that they came up is one of the cool things you can do is after you tour the museum, you can go out to the beach and actually walk the beach and look out on Lake Superior where some of these accidents happened and just think about that. So it's a, it's a special place to a lot of people. It, it really is. Yeah. Corey did a good job summing it up. Uh, you know, we, as he, he referenced the lighthouse, you know, I, I said a little earlier, we've got the oldest operating lighthouse on Lake Superior that's there. And it, that lighthouse even is such a piece of history unto itself. It was built when Abraham Lincoln was president. It dates back to 1861, but yet it's still operating. Uh, and you could walk through that keeper's quarters. And we try to get people to imagine what it would be like living at a remote uh, light station like that. We had one keeper that was there and his family for 20 years and another keeper that followed him that was there for 28 years. And it's, it's hard to imagine. We, we didn't have a life-saving station up there, but we had a Coast Guard lifeboat station that was built 100 years ago this year, 1923. That was constructed and that operated. And uh, we have different exhibits that speak to the, the life-saving service and how dramatic often those rescues were. We actually have, uh, you know, we've talked about the Fitzgerald so much. We have the original bell from the Fitzgerald that was recovered in an expedition in 1995. It was an interesting expedition too. It was really the last to go out there, but it was a combined uh, Royal Canadian Navy, uh, National Geographic, Sony Corporation and Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society uh, expedition to go out. And there was, there was a certain level of documentation that took place of the wreck site. But most importantly, the bell was recovered brought up and uh, it is on display inside the gallery. There was a replica bell with all the names of the crew members on board that was put in place of the original. So our visitors, when they come through, that's often one of the first things that they see as they enter the museum is that that bell from the Fitzgerald. Um, but but like Corey was saying, there's there's a little bit of something for everybody. You can walk walk that rugged shoreline. You can you can look out over the lake. Uh, there's a bird observatory that's up there too. So it is a very uh, wild kind of a site. It's not unusual to have different uh, animals coming onto the site. We've had bears in the past, occasional moose, although that's kind of unusual as our bears, but it's, uh, it's a beautiful location. It is a bit of an adventure going up there, um, but it's really, it's not that far away. And I do think people come away 
as Corey said, inspired uh, by so many of the stories. And these are those human stories of shipwreck, you know, lighthouse keepers at a remote station saving lives by doing what they did and the life-saving service too. So a lot of, a lot of adventure to read about and a lot of interesting stories. Great. And I'm going to make everybody that listens to this promise they have to come up and see the see the museum at some point in time. <laughs> well, Thomas, can, I put a, yeah. <laughs> can we put a shameless commercial plug in? We have a brand new website, too, if people want to visit that. It's shipwreckmuseum.com. Real easy. Shipwreckmuseum.com. Whole new website. And uh, they can learn more about what we do and what we have and when we're open and where we are. That kind of thing. That's excellent. And I'll share that wherever I can as well. Thank you. So, thank you. Gentlemen, I thank you for joining me today. That hour flew by. <laughs> it did. We appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having us.